to the ground. He somehow managed to grab the key and escape to his room. David Cram moved out. Others were not so lucky. By the end of 1977, Gacy had killed 19 young men in his home, all the while carefully maintaining his double life. In May 1978, he was back in the limelight, organizing the Polish Independence Day Parade in Chicago. The guest of honor was none other than First Lady Rosalind Carter. At a function that evening, the serial killer mingled just inches from the president's wife. By December, Gacy was committing a murder every two or three weeks. He showed no signs of stopping until an investigation into a missing youth would lead police to Gacy's front door. By 1978, 36-year-old John Wayne Gacy had sexually tortured and killed 32 young men. He had not only managed to cover up his crimes, but to keep up his status as a businessman and community leader in Chicago. On December 11th, Gacy met with a client of his contracting company at the Nissan Pharmacy in suburban Des Plaines. Gacy was bidding on a remodeling job. Around closing time, he abducted 15-year-old Rob Peast, who worked at the drugstore. Gacy had lured him into the car with the promise of a better paying job with his company. The teenager was never seen alive again. He became Gacy's 33rd victim. The next day, after witnesses at the pharmacy said Peast was last seen with Gacy, police questioned him about the boy's disappearance. He would say, I was in the drugstore, but I never saw him. You got the wrong guy. It was always, I'll cooperate. He had gotten away with so much before that he thought he was so smooth that he'd get away with this one just as easily. This time, Gacy couldn't talk his way out of trouble. Police didn't buy his story and got a warrant to search his house. While they found nothing they could tie to Peast, they did discover numerous personal items belonging to other missing teenagers. Gacy was now a murder suspect. But without the bodies, little could be done. Gacy was placed under 24-hour surveillance. If he was nervous about the police presence, he was putting up a good front. The first night of the stakeout, Gacy picked up the officer's dinner tab. My partner and I had to continuously remind each other that he's a suspect for murder. I mean, he was a very likable guy, and he never really intimidated you. He wasn't the kind of guy that you'd be afraid of, uh, but he was a hustler. Gacy even had the surveillance team over to his house for a fish dinner. When one of the officers smelled a foul odor coming from the air vents, investigators were all but convinced that the crawl space below had become Gacy's makeshift burial ground. We weren't giving up, and he could not lose the evidence. He was sitting on the evidence. And he knew we were seeking a second search warrant. So John was cornered. Gacy realized the truth about his serial killings would soon be exposed. Out of desperation, he met with his attorney for an all-night confession. And then he looked at me and said, I've been the judge, jury, and executioner of many, many people. Now I want to be my own judge, jury, and executioner. I don't want you to interfere. I'm going to tell you everything from the beginning. I kept telling him it was unbelievable, and that's why he offered to show me the crawl space. He was going to prove to me that he committed the murders, and I don't want any part of that. Amarati didn't need to see it, because within hours, investigators were on their way. They had their second search warrant. When they descended into the crawl space, it didn't take long for them to dig up a human bone. On December 21st, 1978, John Wayne Gacy was arrested for murder. At the police station, Gacy seemed to take the news well and even joked with police while they were booking him. When investigators asked where he was born, Gacy looked up and proclaimed that he was, quote, born in a state of confusion. The mugshot captured Gacy laughing at his own wit. 
Gacy also told police that he was not responsible for his brutal acts because he was suffering from a multiple personality disorder. He knew we were going to get the rest of the bodies, and he knew we had human bones, and he knew we weren't going to stop. So now as he's back telling, he's saying, all right, I'm nuts. Gacy's home in suburban Chicago was besieged by a fleet of officers and evidence technicians. Captured on this rare police video, the excavation of the crawl space was carried out with the precision of an archaeological dig. Piece by piece, officers lifted the remains of Gacy's victims through the floorboards and carried them out the front door. It was then that John Wayne Gacy was introduced to the world as the worst serial killer in American history. Yet Gacy seemed more concerned with the police rummaging through his home than with his criminal notoriety. He wanted to make sure his bar that had like 20 some cases of uh, old Milwaukee uh, sitting around it, that he made sure that, that, that nothing was done there and that we didn't dirty his floors. Those who thought they knew him best, his own family, realized they had no idea who John Gacy was. I went into first a denial stage, and then I went into anger. And I told him how much I just hated everything that he had brought upon us. And I saw in my mother, I saw something die in her. There was never that light again. <laughs> there was never that twinkle in her eye from that day forth. It was like someone put the light out.